Okay, so when I was in graduate school, I worked a lot and like 80 hours a week usually. And um, it's difficult, it's not an easy time, uh, but it is interesting. And in one of the meetings with my boss, she said to me, Amanda, you need a hobby, you work too much. And so I decided it'd be fun to keep a six foot long, 100 and what was it, 120 gallon fish tank in my living room. Um, so this is a saltwater tank and there's actually a lot of life in this tank. Um, the sand being the first place to start, there's lots of microbes in there and a lot of important chemistry happens with the sand. So that's an important element of, um, of keeping a healthy, healthy saltwater tank. But also here's an angelfish, there's a clownfish. This guy's a goby, he likes to eat things that are in the sand. There's a shrimp back here. You can see his legs and his antennas. And then we have a bunch of corals too. All the purple stuff you see is algae that grows. This is a coral, this is a coral. So lots of life in here. And all of it depends on ensuring that the pH is stable, which is actually really difficult in a fish tank because it's such a small volume of water. Now, like 100 gallons sounds like a lot, and it is easier to maintain the pH and other nutrients at the right level for that size. But people keep saltwater tanks that are even as small as one gallon. Um, and that's where it gets pretty challenging, right? So here's why it's difficult. Um, if you have just deionized water, we would expect the pH to be a, a seven, right? Because, you know, in a perfect world, it should, should be neutral. We know that's not quite true, but, you know, it's a pretty good estimate. If we have just plain water and I add even one drop of an acid, the pH is gonna go way down, right? So that's like a strong acid calculation, um, but it's gonna go very low, very fast. When you have a fish tank or an actual ocean, it isn't just water, right? There's a lot of other things present there and all of them help to buffer that pH change. So normally seawater has a pH around 8.4. That's average. It does vary from location to location and depending on the temperature and the season and all this stuff, but it's about 8.4. If we add a drop, the same drop, to buffered salt water, um, it's hardly going to change at all. It only goes down to, whoops, it only goes down to like 8.3, maybe, maybe not even that, maybe 8.35. Okay, so here's a graph of that relationship. It's a very nice way of visualizing this. This is called a titration curve. So to obtain this um, sample of regular water at pH seven, one equivalent of acid was added and the pH drops from seven to four. That's crazy, right? Any creature, anything living in that water would die. You can't adjust to, to that rapid of a pH change. The buffered water though, you add, you start around 8.4, you add one drop and it only goes down a teeny bit. That's good because then, you know, stuff doesn't die. But if you keep adding acid, eventually you're gonna use up all of the base that was there. And then you see this dramatic change in pH again. This is called an equivalence point. And then in this case, it actually has two equivalence points. One's down here and one's up here. That means that this base can use two protons. And if you look at the, if you look at the reaction, that's because carbonate can hold on to two protons. And that's the buffer, okay? So um, we, we are gonna do our own titration curve in lab, it will be uh, starting out at a low pH and going up high, but this is a very, very useful thing to realize that buffers stop pH from changing so much. Um, so a second ago, I showed you, I showed you in the corner how to solve an ice table and f when you have a common ion, right? So you plug in the point one, the point one, you solve for X, which is H plus. And it's usually really, really small. Um, 
so that way works. The ice table method and, and plugging it in, solving for H plus and then plugging that into negative log, that'll work every time. In the particular case where you have a buffer, there's a faster equation you can use. So to get to that, let's, let's first define our equilibrium constant here. So that's going to be H plus plus whatever your conjugate is. So like in our acetic acid example, that would be acetate's concentration right there. This is just generic. Don't use this when you're like solving problems, unless you define what A is. Um, so we have this general equation, right? And so if we rearrange so that H plus is on its own, we're going to get HA times KA. And then we have to divide by A minus. Okay, and that's, that's going to be equal to the hydrogen ion concentration. So already that's simpler than um, kind of plugging in the numbers first and then, and then solving it. We can simplify this even more because what we really want is pH. So if we, if we take the negative log of both sides like this, so just like anything in math, if you do it to both sides, it's fair. <laughs> um, so if we do that, uh, we end up with pH on the right hand side and the, we can use the rules about logarithms to kind of separate this apart. So it's going to look like this. So um, when you have divisions and multiplication, there's certain things we can do to sort of separate out those facts. And what you end up with is called the henderson hasselbach equation. So if I have a, the pH of a weak acid with its conjugate base, we can calculate that using the left-hand equation over here, where A minus is the concentration of the conjugate and HA is the concentration of the parent. So like acetate would go on top and acetic acid would go on the bottom. If we have a base um, buffer, so in other words, a high pH buffer, we can use this version where we're using POH and PKB and then conjugate still goes on top and the parent base goes on the bottom. So like if we were doing say ammonia, it's our friend, we like it. That's a basic buffer. As long as you've put ammonia and ammonium together, it'll be a buffer. Um, so in this case, the NH4 goes on the top and the concentration of the NH3 is what goes on the bottom. So even though these say concentrations, um, as it turns out, because you're making a ratio out of them, you actually don't even need to know the volume of the reaction. You can compute the, the um, pH of a buffer just knowing this ratio of at, like conjugate to parent, okay? So here is an example problem. Um, it's a little faster than the other way we did it, right? And so what we're going to do is the same reaction that we looked at before. It's the acetic acid. And in this case, we have 0 0.500 moles and 0 0.500 moles. So we call this, this is a fun phrase, we call this an equimolar con buffer because you have the same number of moles of the conjugate and the parent. And um, so if we want to calculate pH, all we have to do is apply that equation. So we have a Ka in order to, th these, this is from Appendix D, in order to turn that into a pKa, we're just going to go negative log of that number. Again, I can't emphasize this often enough. Um, you want to make sure that you're entering that in your calculator and you get the same answer I do. Don't, don't trust me to give you the right answers. All right, so the pKa of acetic acid is 4.74. And then we go plus the log of the conjugate, which is acetate. 
divided by acetic acid. So I said a second ago that you don't need to know the volume here. That's because if, you know, the strict definition of Ka uses molarities, but this is moles of acetate per liter and the liters is going to be identical for both of them. So like if I had 100 mils or 2000 milliliters or whatever, the volumes are equal because this is in the same container. It's a buffer, so it's all in one beaker or whatever. So that's why the volume doesn't matter. It just cancels mathematically, okay? All right, so what we're gonna end up getting is a pretty simple answer actually. So uh, this is the part in class where I would ask everybody what the answer is and then everybody would pull out their calculators and, and get annoyed with me because I tricked you. <laughs> and so here's the trick, right? So 0 0.5 divided by 0.5 is one. Okay, the log of one is zero. So an equimolar buffer um, turns out that the pH is equal to the pKa because we have an equal number of moles and it cancels and becomes one. And so this whole term ends up being zero, which is 4.74. Oh gosh. Okay, so um, that's a handy shortcut anyway, is to realize pH is pKa if you have the same number of moles of conjugate and, and acid or conjugate and base. Um, Okay, so that's our starting pH, 4.74. The next part is after we add 10 milliliters of HCl. So to solve this one, you need to write out your table here and ask yourself, okay, what is HCl gonna do to this equilibrium? And then you need to add and subtract your X's appropriately, depending on whether you predict the shift is gonna go to the left or the right. So everything we've done so far was a forward shift in our ice tables, which means you subtract reactants and you add to the product side. But in this case, where we might have, we might have a left shift, which means that you're going to subtract from the products and add to the reactants. Okay, so everything we did in lab, everything we did in chapter 15 and 16 comes into play here in trying to figure out where to subtract and where to add. I want you to give it a shot and see how it goes.